This is Inside Politics. I'm Judy Woodruff in Washington. In the presidential election standoff, did the U.S. Supreme Court come close to ruling another way? I'm John King at the White House. The Bush administration is watching the economy, feeling some pressure, and weighing its options. I'm Bill Schneider in Washington. I'll tell you why politicians are having such a hard time thinking outside the lockbox. Also ahead, a prostitution scandal looms over a mayor's re-election bid. Now, Judy Woodruff takes you Inside Politics. Thank you for joining us. Well, President Bush is in Florida today where he has wrapped up a campaign-style event at an elementary school designed to promote his education agenda. But the economy still is the topic of political debate back here in Washington. Our senior White House correspondent John King has more on the economy and Mr. Bush's options. John. Well, Judy, as the president presses for more money for education, more money for defense, just about anything that has anything to do with the budget, of course, the state of the U.S. economy comes up. The White House Press Secretary, Ari Fleischer, just a short time ago, insisting to reporters Mr. Bush is confident that his, quote, economic recovery plan, meaning his tax cut earlier this year, is enough to get the economy going. But many Republicans up for election next year are a little nervous, so the official line at the White House is the president is open-minded. The president's strategy for now is to watch and listen. Going to Florida today. Mr. Bush had hoped the economy would get a jolt from his big tax cut and the Federal Reserve's interest rate cuts. But many nervous Republicans in Congress say it is time to do more. He'll have to look at these uh, other options, and uh, I think it's important that he hear from others what we recommend in the process. One idea gaining steam is a temporary cut in Social Security payroll taxes. That would put more money in workers' pockets immediately but also mean less money in the Social Security Trust Fund down the road. It would uh, undermine one of the long-run uh, objectives of policy right now, which is to strengthen the Social Security system so that it can pay benefits to the baby boomers when they retire. Cutting capital gains taxes is another idea. It will clearly cause a growth in the economy. It always does. And as an aside, it brings in more revenue to the government. But Democrats say cutting capital gains taxes would, for the most part, benefit businesses and wealthy investors and would love the chance to argue that the president's first instinct in a tough economy was to help the rich. We want there to be a formula to get us out of this mess. Any one thing is not going to do it. It's not, you know, we can cut spending, that's not going to do it. We can lower taxes, that's not going to do it. One urgent Bush priority is keeping a promise not to tap the Social Security Trust Fund to pay the government's bills. Now, spending cuts will likely be necessary to keep that from happening in the current fiscal year, which ends on September 30th. The administration already in negotiations with key members of Congress. Also on the table, negotiating the language of a budget rule that would automatically kick in and force spending cuts next year once again, if necessary, to keep that Social Security money off limits. Judy. All right, John King, we want you to stand by at the White House, and we're going to turn now to John Carl, who is at the Capitol, and ask him about some of the things you just raised. John Carl, what about this item that we just heard from uh, your colleague at the White House, uh, this, uh, the, this budget rule that would, in, in effect, uh, bring on across-the-board spending cuts? Well, in fact, tomorrow the House Budget Committee will work on just the kind of rule that John King is talking about. It's called the Social Security Preservation Act. It's meant to be drawn up by the House Republicans on the Budget Committee tomorrow. And the details are still to be worked out. It's not clear if it's going to be a complete across-the-board cut in spending. But the idea is that if Congress, if it looks like the government will dip into the Social Security surplus this year, it would automatically trigger spending cuts next year to cover that, to, to put it right back into the Social Security surplus. Now, there's also an idea on the Senate side, very similar for future years. It would be worked out. That's being worked out by George Voinovich, Republican of Ohio, of Ohio, and also by Zell Miller, who, if you remember, was, the, of course, the chief Democratic sponsor of the tax cut. Now, the idea here is to get this passed so Republicans can say that they are not going to allow the Social Security surplus to be tapped, even cutting into popular programs, if that be necessary. Democrats are already prepared to attack any kind of across-the-board uh, cut in spending is something that it cuts crucial priorities of the president, like education, like defense. And in fact, uh, it's considered far from likely that something like this would pass in the Senate. It would have a challenge in the House, but it seemed almost impossible to pass in the Senate. Republicans know that and actually don't mind that, because what they can do is they can come out and say, hey, we tried not to tap the Social Security surplus. We tried to push for spending cuts, but those Democrats in the Senate wouldn't let us. 
Well, John King, back to you at the White House. What are the people around the president saying? Do they think it makes sense for him to embrace any one of these spending cut proposals? Not just yet. They are in negotiations about the short term. The president and key Republicans don't want to touch the Social Security surplus, so the administration open to that idea, although the public line here is they're still not sure it's necessary to tap in. We know the president's own advisors have told members of Congress they'll probably dip into the Social Security surplus or at least have to make adjustments to prevent that. But publicly, the posture here right now is the president president in no way wants to seem apathetic when it comes to the economy. He wants to seem interested and engaged in the discussion about possible solutions. But all this will be done in the context of budget negotiations and appropriations negotiations that could take several weeks, if not longer. So the president doesn't want to close himself in, block off options by making selections now, endorsing specific proposals now. They'll wait down the road a bit to do that. All right. John King from the White House. Jonathan Carl at the Capitol. Thank you both. Well, joining us now, the President's Secretary of the Commerce Department. He is Don Evans, and he's with us here at the Capitol. And I just want to say, as I introduce you in a moment, we'll be hearing from Gene Sperling, who was former President Clinton's uh, economic advisor. But to you first, Mr. Secretary, is the President at all feeling blindsided by all the bad news we're hearing about the economy right now? Judy, not at all. Uh, we actually started talking about this issue well over a year ago as we were going through the campaign. He, we started talking about the slowdown in the economy, which really started some 12 or 14 months ago and when the president entered into office, entered into office he inherited an economy that was already slowing down and took immediate action, showed leadership, first by pushing a tax cut, second by putting together a comprehensive national energy plan, talking about fiscal responsibility, making sure we spend within our means. And of course, on the, on the monetary side, we've seen interest rates come down some 300 basis points or so. So no, not blindsided. The unemployment numbers, which were disappointing, were, were really a confirmation of a slowdown that we have been seeing for quite some time. But Mr. Secretary, if you've expected all this, then why the flurry of, of uh, efforts right now to look for something to stimulate the economy, well, whether it's with ta more tax cuts or spending cuts or, or spending increases? Well, well uh, Judy, as somebody that was in the private sector for some 26 years and having gone through a number of economic downturns myself and understanding the pain in the private sector to Day, you know, you you're always want to be watching the economy and watching out for signals that may tell you that, listen, we, we need to look at are there other options that we want to pursue. But I wouldn't cause it, call it necessarily a flurry of activity. I would call it just a con continuing to lead on this issue and talk to the American people about it, how important an economic recovery plan is, telling the American people I have one in place, my tax cuts are beginning to take hold, interest rates have come down, and we'll continue to watch the numbers and see if there's something else that maybe needs to be done. Well, let me ask you about some of these uh, remedies that are being sure. thrown about right now. Uh, across the board spending cuts, whether it's a Republican or a Democratic plan, or any of these being looked at seriously at the White House. Judy, you don't take any options off the table. They hit, and when you go through a period like this, you look at all the options, you continue to watch the numbers. You know, one of the things that I think would be most helpful for this economy right now is for this Congress to pass Trade Promotion Authority, which is Fast Track Authority. We need to send these financial markets and capital markets and the American business community the signal that America is going to lead on trade. Or as I talk to business leaders across America, what they say to me is, I want my market to be opened up. Ninety-five percent of the people live out. That's not going to have an immediate stimulus on the economy, is it? I, I think it will, Judy, for this reason, because it starts to send the market a, a level of, of certainty that we're going to lead on this issue. The markets get confidence that we're going to lead on this issue, and, and so do CEOs, and so do businesses. So they begin to invest to get positioned for, for trade opening up around the world. Well, let me ask you about a couple of sure. other proposals just out there today and over the weekend. A cut in the payroll tax, both Republicans and Democrats talking about that. Well, again, Judy, I, I don't think you rule anything out. I don't think, I think you look at all the options. The president's surrounded by a, a very strong team of economic advisors. They'll continue to talk to him about the economy. He'll continue to listen to them. We'll continue to watch the, the uh, economic indicators. We have some more important ones coming out this Friday that we'll watch. And so it'll be an ongoing, uh, ongoing consultation and ongoing discussion. What about a capital gains tax rate cut? We, Senator Lott it's, just said over the weekend it's not a matter of if, but when the president's going to go along with it. Well, this. I don't know about that. Again, you know, we're focused on the consumer has been driving this economy. And that has been good, and people are concerned about capital investment by the business community, and that's why I think opening up trade is so important. But in terms, will there be a capital gains uh, cut? I'm not sure. It's just another one of those options that ought to be considered. 
Well, when you're ready to tell us what the options are, <laughs> we'll be glad to have you uh, here to talk about it. Thank Secretary you, Don Evans, thanks very much. Good to see you. Thank you. Nice to see you, Judy. We appreciate you it. Bet. And now a little history behind the current budget constraints and that boxed-in feeling that some politicians may be experiencing. Here's our senior political analyst, Bill Schneider. Bill. One word, lockbox. Now, where did it come from? It all started back in January 1998, when to everyone's amazement, the deficit turned into a surplus. I will submit to Congress for 1999 the first... January 27, 1998. The whole world was watching to see what President Clinton would say about the Monica Lewinsky story, which had just broken. But the president never mentioned the scandal. Instead, he In diverted attention to a much bigger issue. What should we do with this projected surplus? I have a simple four-word answer. Save... Social Security first. Fast forward to September 1999. Republican leaders of Congress were worried about President Clinton's big spending plans. So they took the president's Social Security pledge and went him one better. And the only way to stop President Clinton from spending the Social Security surplus is to take his credit card and lock it away in our lockbox. They invented the lockbox. The 2000 campaign, George W. Bush took the pledge. We're going to set aside all the payroll taxes and dedicate it to only one thing, and that's Social Security. Al Gore upped the ante by bringing back the lockbox. I'll put Social Security in a lockbox, and I'll veto anything that takes the money out of Social Security for anything other than Social Security. The image stuck. <laughs> Vice President Gore. Lockbox. <laughs> now the surplus is gone, except for the money in the lockbox. Both sides need that money. Democrats want more spending to revive the economy. They can't. Lockbox. Republicans want more tax cuts to revive the economy. They can't. Lockbox. By nearly three to one, the public rejects spending even a small portion of the Social Security surplus to fund programs like education and defense. Recession or no recession, voters say, keep your filthy, rotten hands off the lockbox. Now, there really is no lockbox, not a real one, of course, never was. It's a convenient image that both parties used to advance their agenda. Only now, it controls their agenda. Both parties have locked themselves in the lockbox. Judy? All right, I'm trying to get a hold of that image. Bill Schneider, <laughs> thanks very much. Well, for another view of the economy and budget politics, we're now joined by, as I promised, a former economic advisor in the Clinton White House, Gene Sperling. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Judy. We just heard Commerce Secretary Don Evans say there's nothing surprising really to them about this economy. They knew a year ago that it was, they were heading into a downturn, and uh, they expected what's going on. Well, what's, what they have to answer then is if they knew that there was going to be a weaker period, why did they have a tax cut that was based on such optimism? And what they've really done, Judy, is they've taken away a lot of the fiscal cushion. They've taken away those, that large amount of surplus reserved for debt reduction, Medicare, and Social Security. And that's not only bad for our long-term fiscal discipline, but it's also making it more difficult to respond in a stimulative way to, this, to the weak, weaker economy. But they're arguing that that very tax cut is what's stimulating the economy, that as people get those checks in the mail from the U.S. Treasury, they're going to go out and spend them, and that's going to help the economy. Well, what we need to separate is the short-term versus the long-term on fiscal policy. In the short term, we actually could have done more on stimulus and still protected the Social Security surplus. Remember what this administration did. Because their budget was too big in their first year, they shifted $33 billion out. That was $33 billion that could have been used for stimulating the economy without going into the Social Security surplus. So really, their focus has been much more on a long-term tax cut. Had they given a smaller tax cut that was geared more to working people, more to people likely to spend the money, they could have gotten more stimulus without putting our long-term Social Security surplus in such doubt. But Gene Sperling, you've got Democrats now on Capitol Hill, like uh, Senator Conrad, Chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, saying we need not 
not only that the president's tax cut, well, he's basically saying we need more tax cut, that we could use a larger personal income tax rate cut, which, which seems to me to contradict the argument that you're making. No, I think what, what Senator Conrad and Senator Daschle said all along was they said at the beginning of this year, we should have a tax cut that is smaller in the long term, so it keeps interest rates low, protects our fiscal discipline, but then let's do one that's a more front-loaded but more targeted to working people. See, when you, money goes to people of more moderate incomes, they're more likely to spend it and stimulate the economy. So much of this tax cut goes to upper-income Americans who are not likely probably to go stimulate the economy. So the result is we're close to draining the Social Security surplus when we could have done more for working people to stimulate the economy and still had greater fiscal discipline long run. Another proposal out there to cut uh, the payroll tax. Uh, is this a solution the administration should be looking at? Well, if you'd like my opinion, what I think the administration ought to do is I think that they should look out at 2005 and 2006 where a lot of their tax cut for the most well-off kicks in. If they were to repeal some of that, just moderate the tax cut for the most well-off, they would save hundreds of billions of dollars. But how Democrats, does that affect right now? Here's how it affects it. Because then President Bush could say, I am protecting the Social Security surplus more in the out years by moderating my tax cut for, for well-off Americans. That would probably allow more Democrats to say, well, if we're going to save an extra $100 billion of the surplus for Social Security in the l later years, maybe then we could transfer some of that money to uh, stimulate the economy now, giving it to working uh, families. Because, see, what we really need is we, I think that what we really need and what Democrats are trying to say is more long-term fiscal discipline that protects the Social Security lockbox, Social Security trust fund over the long run. And if we did that well enough, then we could have more flexibility to talk about stimulating the economy without raising long-term interest rates or risking our long-term fiscal discipline path. All right. Gene Sperling, economic advisor to President Clinton, now with the Brookings Institution. Good to see you. Thanks, Judy. It's good to be here. Thank you. We appreciate it. Stay with us. This is Inside Politics. After riots in the spring, the people of Cincinnati face an election showdown tomorrow between two former TV news anchors. Also ahead, a corporate raider is giving away millions. What does he hope the government gets out of it? And next... We'll look at new revelations about the 2000 presidential contest and one Supreme Court justice's powers of persuasion. Live from Washington, there's more of Inside Politics with Judy Woodruff, straight ahead. I remember 20 years ago, how it turned the racing world upside down. First, by introducing the race car with quattro all-wheel drive, and second, by having a woman drive it. The energy industry, what it takes to succeed has changed. Sure, it takes a level head and foresight, but should challenges arise, success will also require a company that's able to take care of business. Introducing Progress Energy. We're stable, but never standing still. My name is Mac Maharaj. During my long imprisonment with Nelson Mandela on Robben Island, all news was forbidden. However, we obtained The Economist under the pretense that we needed it for our study of economics. The authorities later discovered their mistake and the subscription ended. Today, we're free to read what we choose. Yes. What do you say to investors who are a little frightened of the current market? Is this a good time to get out? What if the downtrend continues? First, just relax. When markets are down, we all get fearful about it. Investing is about the long term. If you have a few bonds in your account, a little bit of cash, a little bit of stock, you can weather almost any kind of a market. To learn more, call 1-800-3-SCHWAB today to sign up for our complimentary workshop, Navigating Today's Market. 
He wants a remote photonic network with ultra-high bandwidth for the new plant, where I'll be relocated. The network? Great. We move there? No way. You can accomplish anything, even optical networking. Fujitsu, the possibilities are infinite. Would you like to lower your monthly mortgage payments or use the equity in your home to consolidate your credit card or other debts? Just log on to Ditech.com or call 1-800-71-FIX. Today's low fixed rate with zero points is only 6.875%. Lower interest rates, lower monthly payments. It's smart money from Ditech.com. For fast, friendly service, apply online or call 1-800-71-FIX right now. Today's trip to Florida is the fourth time President Bush has visited the Sunshine State since taking office. Mr. Bush appeared at an education event alongside his brother, Governor Jeb Bush. Florida's pivotal role in the presidential election always seems to add an extra dimension to the president's Florida trips. Newsweek magazine reporter David Kaplan has written a new book, The Accidental President, about the election and the Supreme Court decision that finally brought it to a close. David Kaplan joins us from New York. And David Kaplan, what uh, I think is most interesting is the reporting you did on the Supreme Court itself, the justices and the discussions among themselves. Boil it down for us to what happened in the final day before the 5-4 to four decision came down. Well, the, the, the court had already figured out the Saturday before when they stopped the Florida recount that they were rough, that they were split 5-4. They stopped the recount, and the only question was whether anybody was going to change their minds. They didn't, but Justice Souter meeting with a group of prep school students several weeks after the decision came out explained to them in this private gathering that he thought that if he had just one more day, he might have been able to flip Justice Anthony Kennedy in the 5-4 ruling for Bush would have become a 5-4 ruling for Gore. Now, why did he? Why was he so confident? Is your, did your reporting answer that? Well, you know, not, not wholly satisfactorily. I don't have evidence that Justice Kennedy actually was about to flip. I have Justice Studer, Souter's state of mind that he thought he could get Justice Kennedy to go. And, of course, Justice Kennedy, it, it, it's not an unreasonable proposition on Justice Souter's part. Justice Kennedy, though a member of the court's conservative bloc, for 14 years has been in the middle of the court. He's not really on the hard right of the court with, with Chief Justice Rehnquist, Anthony Scalia, Clarence Thomas. And he's kind of known inside the building as Flipper. Law clerks like to call him Flipper for someone who changes sides, the great equivocator. And in one of the landmark abortion decisions early in the 90s that didn't overturn Roe v. Wade, he changed sides, so not unreasonable for Souter to think that Kennedy was the guy to go to. Some very strong feelings on the side of the, the four justice minority that lost out, those who voted uh, uh, in, the, in the other direction. David Kaplan, uh, let me ask you about the comment. Uh, you quote uh, Justice Stephen Breyer, who was in the minority, is at one point telling a group of visiting Russian justices, uh, quoting this decision, saying it was the most outrageous indefensible thing the court had ever done, again, this, these are your words, the court had ever done, telling them, quote, we all agree to disagree, but this is different. Just how upset were he and the other justices in the minority? Well, Breyer clearly was. I think Ginsburg, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was more baffled than angry. Justice Stevens just expressed being tired. He's the oldest member of the court at 80. I think it was Breyer who, who, whose anger, frustration really came through. And, and what, what I guess struck me is the, the, the contrast between these comments and a lot of the public statements that they've made at bar conventions, speeches and whatnot, trying to put this behind them and saying there wasn't all that much division within the court. Now, these comments don't show that or even allege that any of the conservatives had partisan agendas or, or that right, they were actively doing the bidding of George Bush. But it does show that within a few weeks after the decision, the divisions inside were, were bitter and boiled over when provoked by this rather sarcastic question in private by one of the Russian justices saying, so hey. explain to me, how does it work in your country? <laughs> and finally, uh, let me ask you about the, one of the, another very interesting quote you, you have in, in your book uh, where you quoting Justice Kennedy explaining what he did and saying, 
uh, I guess, feeling the need to explain it and saying sometimes you just have to be responsible and step up to the plate. Uh, what was he representing there? That was vintage. That was vintage Tony Kennedy. More than all the chatter about equal protection and other doctrine that the court cited in its opinion, this was Justice Kennedy doing as he's done in the past and saying, you know, this court is important. He was kind of thumping his chest and saying, we've got to step in and prevent chaos. And that's what he, that's what we saw going on with these recounts in his mind on television. And he wasn't content to say, as he might have said, as the dissenters wanted him to say, if, if you have a problem with what's going on in Florida or the Florida Supreme Court ruling, just go across the street to Congress, which is the branch of government the Constitution set up uh, to resolve disputed presidential elections. Steve, that isn't uh, Tony Kennedy's style. All right. So David it, it, it all, I was just going to go ahead and finish your thought. I was going to say it's all. It, it's another reason that I that I was struck that that Souter would go after Kennedy. And on the one hand, Kennedy may be an equivocator. On the other hand, he's not one to defer to the other branches. All right, David Kaplan. We're going to leave it there. David Kaplan with Newsweek magazine, the author of the book. The Accidental President, looking at the Supreme, in particular, at the role the Supreme Court justices play. Thanks very much. Thank you, Drew. The last minute ad blitz is underway in several political primaries. We'll check in with the latest in the television ad wars just ahead, but up next, another major corporation announces a round of layoffs. That story and some of this day's other top headlines in our news update. Enter a new era of discovery at Bristol-Myers Squibb, where groundbreaking genetic research is underway. Winning the Tour de France was a victory for cancer medicines. But Luke, it's just the start of incredible things to come. Imagine, Luke, your medical history, the story of your genes on a card you carry in your wallet. Your doctor sees your cancer coming years before and gives you a daily pill to take that could prevent it. At the Bristol Myers Squibb Center for Applied Genomics, researchers strive to unlock the secrets of breast and colon cancer, Alzheimer's, and diabetes. They're developing medicines tailored to your unique genes. Bristol Myers Squibb is beginning a revolution in medicine. Our goal is to extend and enhance life and to lead the way in new frontiers against disease. Hope, triumph, and the miracle of medicine. Bristol Myers Squibb Company. Sorry. There are lots of ways to climb to the top. Achieve new balance. His name means business. Lou Dobbs Money Line next. Then what's happened since the sun came up? Watch first evening news followed by Crossfire on CNN. But I will be watching you. Looks good. That's just for starters. So much to watch, so little time. HBO, all these channels. Extensive, not expensive. Get it with a click or a call. HBO, just $12.99 a month on Dish Network. Go for it. When you have money problems, just going to the mailbox can be frightening. It's the same when the phone rings. You know it's another creditor. I thought bankruptcy was the only way out. And then I called Ameridet. Every day, Ameridet helps more people with money problems. We're a nonprofit organization offering free consultations to consumers seeking to eliminate their debt. Now my balances are dropping, and I only have one small monthly payment. Call this number regardless of your situation. Ameridet, helping America get out of debt. This is CNN. More Inside Politics coming up. But first, we join Bill Hemmer at the CNN Center in Atlanta for a look at some of the day's other top stories. And good afternoon. Every year, hundreds of thousands of American children 
are the victims of sexual exploitation. That's according to a new three-year study by the University of Pennsylvania. It calls the problem the least recognized epidemic in the U.S. Among the findings, as many as 400,000 kids are victims of prostitution, pornography, and other types of commercial sex. Married men with children of their own are among the most common customers, and 96% of sexual assaults on kids are committed by relatives and acquaintances. One of the main authors in that study explains how the abuse starts for some victims. 40% of all the girls on the street doing prostitution for money, juvenile prostitution, acknowledge that they themselves were victims of child sexual abuse or child sexual assaults in their own home prior to running away. In fact, it was the sexual abuse and sexual assaults that prompted these 40% of girls to run away from home in the first place. From Sacramento now, a police chase ended earlier today with the killing of a mass murder suspect. Police say Joseph Ferguson shot himself after leading officers on a 40-minute chase in a stolen car. A highway patrol officer and a bystander were also injured in that. Ferguson believed to have killed five co-workers, including his former girlfriend, because they say he was upset over their breakup and being suspended from his job. More bad news for the economy, citing poor tire sales. Michelin says it'll cut 2,000 jobs. Michelin blames the cuts on slower sales, the tractor-trailer industry. A company spokeswoman says Michelin hopes all of those cuts will come through normal attrition and voluntary severance in the company. A first-of-its-kind tobacco case goes to trial in West Virginia. A quarter of a million plaintiffs want cigarette makers to pay for annual testing for diseases like cancer and emphysema. None of the pack-a-day smokers, though, known to suffer now from any smoking-related illness. Newark officials investigating the cause now of a fire that closed the runways at Newark International Airport that blazed several miles from the terminal, but the airport diverted its firefighting equipment to help fight it. Flights were halted about an hour and a half today as the fire consumed part of administration building already under construction there in Newark. Much more on these stories and a whole lot more coming up on CNN's first evening news. We're about 90 minutes away at 7 o'clock Eastern time and 4 on the West Coast. We'll see you right after Lou Dobbs' money line tonight. But for now, back to Judy and more of IP in Washington. Judy? Thank you, uh, Bill, and I have a little bit of news, and that is there apparently will be another dole on the campaign trail next year. Two sources telling CNN's Jonathan Carl that Elizabeth Dole, former presidential candidate, former Secretary of Labor, will file papers tomorrow, Tuesday, on her intention to run for the U.S. Senate seat from the state of North Carolina. That, of course, the Republican seat being vacated by Jesse Helms, who just announced a couple of weeks ago, his intention to step down after decades in the United States Senate. CNN, of course, will be following that story tomorrow very closely. Odd alliances and the political ad wars. We'll look at the latest commercials and the cash being spent on them. Also ahead. Is he covering up uh, to protect his, his buddies uh, in town? I don't know. In Maryland, a mayor faces re-election and questions about a client list for an alleged prostitution ring. Point. Shoot. Create. The HP Pavilion 7970 with the Intel Pentium 4 processor. How will you use it? Save up to $250 by mail on the HP Digital Photography Studio. This is Lance. Lance is tired. He's thirsty. And he's aware the way out here no one would ever know if he eased up a bit. But he won't. It seems he's developed a fondness for yellow. Discipline creates performance. AIM funds. The idea is discipline. The purpose is performance. The name is AIM. When you travel on business, don't downsize. Amerisize at Amerisuites. Need more room to spread out? Get more workspace and features like high-speed internet access. Plus more space to unwind in a comfortable suite for the price of an ordinary hotel room. And when it comes to breakfast, 
Don't downsize. Amerisize. Get Amerisweet's free Bountiful Breakfast Buffet every morning. Next time, check into Amerisweet's. Don't downsize. Amerisize. It besets thousands and often without warning. But can Alzheimer's be predicted? Are there new and improved ways to determine who might develop this debilitating disease? We'll find out. CNN Tonight, 10 Eastern. Tonight, it's the classic, The Great Escape, on a special edition of Movies for Guys Who Like Movies. Plus, Rick Schwartz takes you through the tunnels of Paris with an exclusive behind-the-scenes look at HBO's Band of Brothers. You're gonna love this. You're there, face-to-face -face with the enemy, seeing what it was really like for the soldiers who laid it all on the line. It's a life experience. It's a special edition of Movies for Guys Who Like Movies. Tonight at 8 Eastern, only on TBS Superstation. Some look forward to fall for great weather. Bob Costas looks ahead to great sports action. Get his take on everything from Barry Bonds' home run tear to the NFL refs, plus what Bob really thinks about politics and more. On Greenfield at Large, tonight, 1030 Eastern on CNN. Repeating a story we told you just a few moments ago, CNN's Jonathan Carl learning Elizabeth Dole has decided tomorrow to announce that she's filing the papers to run for the U.S. Senate seat in the state of North Carolina, running for the seat held, being held now by Jesse Helms, who just a week or so ago announced his retirement. We're told the announcement will come from her hometown of Salisbury, North Carolina. Tomorrow at 1 o'clock, CNN will carry that live. And again, uh, this news coming from CNN's Jonathan Carl, who's uh, coming over right now. We're, we can try to get him on the air right now. If we can put a microphone on you, John, that's a good bit of reporting. Uh, you've been talking, I know you've been working on this story for some days. What are the people around Mrs. Dole saying? Well, what we hear is that uh, Mrs. Dole has informed the chairman of the North Carolina Republican Party that she is, in fact, going to file her papers tomorrow officially becoming a candidate for the U.S. Senate. She has promised the chairman that she is going to campaign in all 100 of North Carolina counties. And uh, she is now going to make it official tomorrow that she's a candidate for U.S. Senate. Do we have any idea, to Jonathan, why she agonized over this for so long? We, we had reports last week that uh, the some senators were going to her and saying, make up your mind here. Well, I think from the Elizabeth Dole camp, they might say, well, this was actually a pretty quick decision, given that it was just a couple of weeks ago that Jesse Helms announced he wasn't going to run again. It was just a couple weeks ago that we really first saw Elizabeth Dole's name floated as a possible candidate. So while many were expecting her to jump ahead, you know, earlier, uh, she'd probably say this is a pretty quick decision. Now, it is a potentially crowded field down there in North Carolina, obviously. We already heard from Richard Vinroot, who has twice run for governor as the Republican nominee in North Carolina. He is officially a candidate. We're waiting to hear from Congressman Richard Burr, another possible candidate. So that's why people have been saying, Elizabeth Dole, get in this quick, because you're going to have a crowded primary if you don't. Former U.S. Senator Locke Fairclaw saying he will not be a Republican candidate. And there are a few names out there on the Democratic side. The state secretary of state, uh, I think it's Ellen Marshall, Elaine Marshall. Elaine Marshall, yes. Yeah. And uh, perhaps Dan Blue, the former Speaker of the State House, now a state legislator. Yeah, Dan Blue has made it. Uh, has also said that he is going to run. So it is uh, on the Democratic side. They think they've got an opportunity here. Republicans in Washington, of course, as they've been telling you, uh, believe that Elizabeth Dole is their, you know, slam dunk candidate. But the question is, can they clear the Republican primary field for her? They were most worried about Senator Faircloth, so they saw that as good news that he's not running. But Vinroot's been out there. He announced immediately, I mean, just within days of Jesse Helms' announcement, that he would run. All right, Jonathan Carl, great reporting. Thanks very much. We appreciate your running over here to get this on the air. <laughs> Thanks very much. Well, voters head to the polls tomorrow for primary elections in several states across the country. And with Congress also back at work here in Washington, we're seeing a flurry of new political advertising. CNN's Gene Meserve now with more on the candidates and the issues filling the airwaves. Last year, Congressman Chris Smith voted to keep the promise. First on the scene is the United Seniors Association, pushing a version of Medicare reform sponsored by the president. Strengthen and improve Medicare and add affordable prescription drug coverage for seniors. The ads target select members of Congress in their home districts. Uh, this is a, a pro-prescription drugs benefits group, and, and the tactic that they've taken is that it's back to work, back to school, and back to issue advocacy ads. Uh, this group has spent half a million dollars in 10 congressional districts over the past week. 
Uh, what they're trying to do is to influence those Congress people that were either not with them or that were with them previously and trying to maintain some support. Uh, the group, I'm sure, feels this is important because uh, they're going to go into this next legislative session with a dwindling budget surplus. They're going to com be competing against the education issues. They're going to be competing against the military spending issues. And they want to make sure that their issue is forefront uh, in the minds of the congressmen as they go back. Primary voters in Massachusetts head to the polls Tuesday. The election is being held to replace the late Democratic Congressman Joe Moakley. State Senator Cheryl Jakes is on the offensive, accusing fellow Senator Stephen Lynch of going soft on the gun issue. Receiving top ratings from the NRA. The NRA already has too many friends in Washington. I'll put your safety first. Well, five years ago, my cousin Brian was shot nine times just down the street from my family's home. He died. The idea that I don't support getting guns off the street couldn't be more wrong. Uh, this is an interesting Democratic uh, uh, campaign, and I'll tell you why. Uh, principally, uh, Stephen Lynch has spent the most money in the, in the uh, race so far, uh, but his opponent, uh, uh, Cheryl Jakes, has spent the, uh, a small amount of money, but she's taken it against an issue that you would not expect to see in a Democratic primary. It's all about gun control. Uh, she has tagged uh, uh, Lynch with, uh, with almost a pro-NRA uh, slant, and so he has had to come on air and counter that. Now, that's not something that you expect to see in a Democratic primary of, of, of this nature. The New York mayoral He's primary is also right this Tuesday. In one new ad, Democrat, Democrat Alan Hevesy focuses on his Hevesy party's favorite target, Rudy Giuliani, though Giuliani isn't even running. Rudy always attacks people who stand up to him. But Democrat Alan Hevesy has the guts and independence to do what's right. Billionaire Republican Michael Bloomberg is still spending right. big money and bringing right in a big name to promote his campaign. I've known Mike Bloomberg for years. He does know the special interests a thing. In the spending race, it's Michael Bloomberg. Uh, he's way out in front. He spent $12 million of his own funds. Second on the Democratic side, you see uh, Alan Hevesy spending $3 million, uh, weighing in against uh, Mark Green and Fernando Ferrer's uh, $1.5 million. Um, and here are the tactics behind it. Right now on the Democratic side of the equation, this may end up to be a Democratic runoff. Uh, and, and it's between Hevesy, Ferrer, and, and Green. Um, this is, this is a not a good scenario for the Democrats if they have to spend more money against each other before they face Bloomberg. In the category of the Republican primary, we've got some interesting twists here. You saw John McCain, who's uh, uh, traditionally been the poster boy for campaign finance, out there supporting the poster boy for the self-financed billionaire candidate. So, you know, in the category of politics, make strange bedfellows, go figure. Gene Meserve, CNN reporting. So voters going to the polls in those races and many more tomorrow. CNN will be watching those races and, of course, bringing you the results tomorrow night and on Wednesday as soon as we have them. Inside Politics will be right back. Thomasville is now at the Home Depot. Thomasville? Yeah, you got my attention. Thomasville craftsmanship. Thomasville quality. It's classy, it's American, it's elegant. And now for your kitchen or bath, Thomasville cabinetry. Kitchen cabinets? Thomasville is great stuff. Now for kitchens, now for baths, and only at the Home Depot. Home Depot makes beautiful things affordable. This is why you go to Home Depot first. Thomasville, exclusively at the Home Depot. Hey, get off the counter. Promise you'll call me. I will. I promise. No matter where you go, I will be with you. If it takes a long, long time. is a promise. Wherever you are and whatever you do, Alliance with its global partners is the power on your side. There is a venture capitalist out there with hundreds of millions of dollars for technology firms. Startups, expansions, firms with new ideas, all in a friction-free business environment. Why would a venture capitalist work this way? Because they're convinced that technology is a can't-miss investment. And they'll do whatever it takes to help companies succeed. Who is this venture capitalist? Pennsylvania.
Model 5 Series. The nation's unbearable economy has many Americans concerned with dropping markets and rising unemployment. Who's to blame and who's got the solution? A debate of economic proportions with Press and Carlson in the crossfire. Tonight, 7.30 Eastern on CNN. He says he talks to the dead. Skeptics say no way. Can he really speak to the other side? An extraordinary hour with renowned psychic John Edward. He'll take your calls. Tonight, 9 Eastern on Larry King Live. Just north of us here in Washington, outside the Beltway, the small town of Frederick, Maryland, is holding a mayoral primary tomorrow. The incumbent is seeking a third term, but he almost decided not to run again because of a prostitution scandal that has shaken city government. CNN's Patty Davis has more on the election, the scandal, and a list of mystery names. Historic Frederick, Maryland fast becoming a thriving new bedroom community for Washington, D.C., in political turmoil over the world's oldest profession. Two years ago, police raid an escort service run by this woman. The police came in, storming through this door, grabbed all of our computers. Computers which held a list of clients, the service's so-called black book. Steve Miller is a reporter for the Frederick News Post. The allegations were made that elected officials were named as clients of the prostitution ring. Yes, there, there are guys who are going to be very, very nervous right now. Miller presses police to release the list. Enter Frederick's Republican mayor, Jim Grimes. Instead of making the book public, the mayor orders Potter's book returned to her. By then, Potter had pled guilty to operating a call girl service. Smelling cover-up, the Frederick News Post sues Grimes under the state's Public Information Act. Is he covering up uh, to protect his, his buddies uh, in town? I don't know. Grimes, who's running for re-election, says his name is not in the book and flatly denies he's covering up anything. Absolutely not. He says he's just trying to protect the city from lawsuits. I acted on advice of counsel, you know, who knew more about you know, the liability side of that than, than I do. That's not good enough for Democrat Jennifer Doherty, who's running against Grimes. She says it looks suspicious to her. If he has seen the contents, he should be willing to say, it's clear none of the people in my administration are involved in any way. Grimes says he's never seen the Black Book list of names. I never had them. Never for one second of my life have I ever had control of them. I never saw them. In fact, Grimes says he's the one who asked police to investigate the escort service in the first place. The town still doesn't know who's in the black book and who's not, but the alleged madam says one elected official, Frederick Alderman Blaine Young, was a client. I'm not denying it, but I'm just saying that, that uh, the services that if I have used uh, are of a legal nature, it's, it's my personal business. With the mayoral election around the corner, opponents are seizing on the scandal. The city's reputation is being damaged by this, and I find that insulting, and so do a lot of other residents. The case of the Black Book is now in the hands of a circuit court judge. The mayor says if the judge orders its release, he'd support that. Frederick is known as the home of Francis Scott Key and Barbara Fritchie. Whatever the outcome of the election, this quiet city isn't anxious to be known now as the home of Angelica Potter's Black Book. Patty Davis, CNN, Frederick, Maryland. From the politics of today, hearkening back to the Kennedy era and JFK's call to public service. Up next, a multi-millionaire tries to spread that message to today's young people. Introducing a new premium sedan from Hyundai with soft leather, traction control, V6 power, and the freedom of America's best warranty plan. All for less than 24,000, the new Hyundai XG300. Fly first class for the price of coach. Get 0.9% APR financing on the XG300 now. It's easy to take electricity for granted. A lot of us aren't even sure where it comes from. So we're sometimes surprised to learn that over half of the electricity we use comes from coal. To a $50 billion investment in clean coal technologies by America's electric utilities that use coal, it's getting cleaner every day. 
helping us protect something we can't take for granted. Our environment. We can expect Amy? in the coming months is director of Amy? product development, oh. Paul Noon. Nice speech. Got it. Nortown Networks is building the new high-performance internet, the wireless internet, with optical technology Overall, that makes it faster. Overall, this has been an exciting and more reliable. year. But the next few months, the next few months will mark the beginning of a new... <laughs> Gesundheit. Come together. In fact, with technology changing over me. Would you like to lower your monthly mortgage payments or use the equity in your home to consolidate your credit card or other debts? Just log on to Ditech.com or call 1-800-71-FIXED. Today's low fixed rate with zero points is only 6.875%. Lower interest rates, lower monthly payments. It's smart money from Ditech.com. For fast, friendly service, apply online or call 1-800-71-FIXED right now. Beyond the headlines about the economy, the budget, and legislative battles, there is another growing concern here in Washington about a brain drain. A new organization is being launched this week to encourage the best and brightest to consider working for government. CNN's Brooks Jackson talked to a businessman who has taken the issue to heart. How do you get to be a multi-millionaire corporate raider? This one started here 28 years ago, handling civil appeals for the U.S. Justice Department. And now, Sam Heyman is giving $25 million of his own money to attract today's young people to public service. Why are you doing that? Well, Brooks, I, I feel that uh, the single most uh, critical uh, national issue in America today uh, relates to the state of our government service and the inability of government to attract and retain in sufficient numbers uh, our brightest and, and best. More than 50 percent of the entire <coughs> federal uh, government workforce will be eligible for retirement uh, by the year 2004 and more than 70 percent of our senior uh, government officials uh, will qualify for retirement at that time as well. Heyman says the brain drain threatens the quality of government, from collecting taxes to controlling airliners. This is a, a tremendous uh, a challenge that in corporate America you would never let happen in running a corporation. You're always grooming young people to take uh, more senior roles in your, in your company. But Heyman and others say too few young people seem interested in government careers today. It wasn't always like that. When I graduated uh, law school, I remember 30%, this was in 1963, uh, I remember 30% of my class went to Washington or state and local uh, governments. Among those Harvard Law School classmates, Janet Reno. It was a different time. Ask what you can do for your country. Of course, those were the days of the Kennedy administration, uh, what we called at the time the new frontier. Uh, President Kennedy's election uh, had created uh, uh, a sense of enormous excitement. What changed? It's a number of things, obviously. It's the Vietnam War, the, the scandals that we read about in the newspapers, uh, the political scandals. Thank you for calling the Partnership for Public Service. Now, Heyman's $25 million is funding a new organization, the Partnership for Public Service, officially launching this week, promoting the advantages of working for government. When I came here in 1963 as a young lawyer out of law school, uh, I was interested not only in government service, but getting experience in the courtroom. Within a couple of months, I was in a courtroom arguing cases. But Heyman knows from the experience of his own four children, government careers today are a tough sell. All of my children uh, went to Washington uh, for summers during their college uh, years, uh, either as interns in congressional offices, Senate pages, and what have you. And although they all had uh, wonderful experiences, uh, not one of them had the uh, 
uh, any interest whatsoever in pursuing a career How did you feel in about government that? service. For, government. Forgive me, I've got to ask you, if you can't convince your own children to go into <laughs> public service, uh, how are you going to convince others? Well, I mean, I think that that's, that's the challenge uh, we have today. Brooks Jackson, CNN, Washington. Growing business. And coming up, someone in government, a senator flying high. There's only uh, the appropriate uh, statement, that is, go Big Red, uh, beat Notre Dame. Nebraska's Ben Nelson cheers on the home team in the air without the airplane. That's next on Inside Politics. He says he talks to the dead. Skeptics say no way. Can he really speak to the other side? An extraordinary hour with renowned psychic John Edward. He'll take your calls tonight, 9 Eastern on Larry King Live. Then it besets thousands and often without warning. But can Alzheimer's be predicted on CNN tonight at 10? Followed by Greenfield at Large at 1030. That's all tonight on CNN. His name means business. Lou Dobbs Money Line next. Then, what's happened since the sun came up? Watch First Evening News, followed by Crossfire on CNN. Are you one of the millions of American males who would like increased sexual energy? If you've been considering Viagra as a solution, consider something different. All natural NRX. Clinical studies show various ingredients of NRX enhance sexual energy, increasing desire, performance, and satisfaction. NRX is all natural with no side effects. With NRX, you'll feel the increased energy within minutes and with no chemicals. We're so sure you and your mate will be completely satisfied. We'll offer you a 30-day, no questions asked, full refund. NRX stimulates sexual energy by expanding the blood vessels, causing increased blood flow to specific areas of the body. Unleash the power of NRX now. Call 1-800-367-7960 toll-free, and it will be delivered discreetly to your home. Get results using the safe, all-natural alternative, NRX. Hey, I'll get this. Besides, I get airline miles. With your business card. Huh. What is your credit card doing for your small business? You earn miles on everything you buy? Yeah, from supplies to travel expenses. The City Platinum Select Advantage Business Card. Call now and you could get one mile for every dollar you spend. Miles that may never expire, plus 10,000 bonus miles. I use my miles for car rentals, hotels, on over 25 top airlines, <laughs> even a well-earned vacation. Plus, get benefits like account summaries, business discounts, online fraud protection, and more. Call now to request your card. I'd like the City Advantage business card and 10,000 bonus miles. And soon, your miles could take you almost anywhere. Oh, Paris is great. And flying free <laughs> makes it even better. <laughs> Smart business decision. The City Advantage business card. Call now to request your card and 10,000 bonus miles. This is CNN. I'm sure that being a United States senator has its ups and downs, but few, if any, of Ben Nelson's colleagues have had a ride like this one. The Nebraska Democrat followed through on his plan to skydive over the weekend before the Nebraska Notre Dame football game. Nelson was tethered to a jump master with the Army's Golden Knights parachute team. While these pictures may make some of you a little bit queasy, Senator Nelson says he was at ease with the jump. We're just glad that he made it down safely. We're also glad it was him and not us. Every Friday, our Bill Schneider awards a political play of the week, and we want your nominations. You can email your ideas to insidepolitics at CNN.com and tune in on Fridays to see if you picked the play of the week. That's all we have time for in this edition of Inside Politics, but of course you can go online all the time at CNN's allpolitics.com. AOL keyword, CNN. And our email address is insidepolitics at cnn.com. I'm Judy Woodruff, and now with a look ahead at what's coming up next on Moneyline, a man who I think did some skydiving, Lou Dobbs. Hi, Lou. 
Hi, Judy. Thank you. President Bush uh, makes fixing this economy a priority for his administration. We'll take a look at what he plans to do. And Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld wants to fix the Pentagon. He joins us tonight to talk about what is an ultimate war on bureaucracy. We'll also be taking a look at the hottest real estate market in this country. And Blockbuster goes high tech and takes a big charge. We'll tell you tonight what's behind the company's charge and its move into DVDs. All of that and a lot more coming up uh, right now on Moneyline. Please join us.